So uh, time dilation is the first consequence of this postulate of special relativity that uh, I want to explore. So um, this is the thought experiment. Imagine you built a clock that operates this way. So you have a clock that operates by bouncing light back and forth between two mirrors. And you know, um, so I have uh, one mirror here. I have another mirror here. And um, if, uh, if these two mirrors are separated by distance L, then um, you know, when I have a light beam or pulse here, bounces up, bounces from here, comes down, then I can use that round trip to, as my ticking of a clock. Or I guess, um, yeah, let me use the round trip. So as it goes up, comes down, when it comes down here, then some amount of time has passed. That amount of time t should be equal to so 2L divided by c. Good? Yeah? I feel like uh, this is particularly nice clock because I, we've been just told the speed of light is constant at c. So if I can keep this length stable, then c is guaranteed to be the same, then it'll keep the same time no matter what happens. Now, we want to explore what happens um, as uh, this clock is moving. And we want to be careful in the specification here. I want to specify that this clock is moving in a direction that's a perpendicular to this axis. So it's moving in a direction that's perpendicular. Um, so it's a, let's imagine that the clock, uh, let me see. Imagine that this clock is moving with the speed of v in a direction perpendicular to the uh, direction that the, the clock is oriented in. Yeah. So if you are an observer, A, staying with the clock, then nothing will change. That's the principle of relativity, right? So whether this reference frame is moving or is stationary, none of that makes a difference. Um, from the person who's staying with the clock, nothing about the clock has changed. So I want to give that a special name. Uh, let me call that proper time. So this time, let me call that, um, use a special letter, uh, lo uh, Greek, lowercase tau, to indicate this time. This is what we are going to call proper time. There's one special proper time for every object. Like uh, my own proper time is proper time of the time kept by whatever reference frame I was in. Um, or like proper time of a train that's moving is the time kept in the reference frame where the train was stationary. So whoever's moving in the train. So, so let's, let me call this proper time. Then what we want to look at is how does this clock look from the perspective of observer B. So from the perspective of observer B, who's sitting out here watching the clock move, does it still take the same amount of time for this light to bounce from, um, from one mirror to the other mirror and then come back? So from the perspective of B, are these two mirrors staying stationary? No, they are moving, right? So um, so as this light reaches here, this mirror actually moves over here, right? And in the amount of time for the light to come back, this bottom mirror has moved even more to over here. Okay? So the path of the light for observer B should look something like this. So this is the path of the light that the observer B sees. Um, and, and, and that's what he observes. And let's just see how much time, um, at what time t, the light comes back to this mirror. Now, for observer A, who stayed with the clock, so if I'm drawing everything, so observer A was here when the light hit there, and observer A is here 
when the light comes back, this same amount of time would have passed for observer A. So we are looking at, for observer B, how much time passed? Well, I think I have all the diagram. I think I can figure out how much distance all this is. And how fast is light moving for observer B? See, because that's the second postulate of special relativity. So, so I can calculate how much time this is. Let's do that and see how much that actually is. So I guess I need to first figure out the, um, the distance that the light has to travel in, in the reference frame of B. So, um, so this is an assertion that I'll need to make without um, uh, spending too much effort to trying to prove it. Uh, I think this distance is going to remain the same. It's the, it's the distance that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, and that in that direction, the length is not going to change. Good? OK, as long as you believe that, <laughs> move on. So this height will remain at length L. Um, and I can come back and double check this when we have introduced Lorentz transformation. It's easier for me that way. Um, so I need to know the length of this side. Um, let me call that delta x. Then this is a right triangle. I can figure out the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse should be square root of L squared plus delta x squared. So I need an expression for delta x. How far did the mirror travel in half the amount of time for the round trip? Can I use this expression? Not quite, right? Because this is not the time for this. This is the time for this. So I have to actually leave this as an algebraic expression, that this delta x is equal to speed times and some expression of this unknown time. So half this total amount of time, so t over 2. Um, and then return trip is exactly the same. So let me write down this algebraic expression and see if I can solve it for t. Okay. So the algebraic expression is the, the time of travel is equal to the distance. That would be twice this twice this distance, square root of L squared plus um, delta x squared, which is the V squared T squared over 4. Um, distance traveled divided by speed. What's the speed? C. C. Speed of light is always a C. Um, by the way, that's one easy answer you can always get when we do special relativity. No matter what the situation tells you, speed of light is always C. That's one of your postulates. Uh, even when it doesn't make sense, you know it's at least the correct. Speed of light in vacuum is always a C. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I do want you to make sense of it, but that's at least it's like a mantra. All right, um, so I have that. So time of travel would be T. So all of this is equal to T and um, if, if this is beginning to look familiar, it's because it is. It's like what we did before. I have t on both sides of this expression, so uh, I'm not done yet. I have to solve it for t. So let me solve it for t. Uh, square both sides. So I have 4 over c squared times this l squared plus um, v squared t squared over 4 is equal to t squared. Um, collect like terms. Uh, um, let me go step by step. Distribute this. So you have 4L squared over c squared. 4L squared over c squared plus force cancel. So I have v squared over c squared times t squared is equal to t squared. Now I can collect the like terms on the same side. So moving this over here, I get minus v squared over c squared t squared. That's equal to this. 
um, factor out t squared, I get 1 minus v squared over c squared times t squared. All right, I'm going to solve for t in one single step. Everyone OK with that? OK, let me do that. t is equal to square root of this. So 2L divided by C divided by this. Divided by square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. Seems correct to everyone? Yes. Yeah. And uh, let me introduce a new notation. In, so as we are going through special relativity, you are going to see this factor a lot. This factor of 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. It just occurs so many times that if I had to write it down every single time I saw it, my hand will get tired. So there's, uh, we call it gamma factor or Lorentz factor. We introduce symbol, this symbol, gamma, Greek letter, is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So standard notation for special relativity. It saves a lot of writing. So in terms of that, this t is equal to 2L over c times gamma. Or let's see, I see 2L over c was this proper type. So this is what we can say. This uh, amount of time it takes for the light to come back, t is equal to gamma times the proper time tau. And this is the statement of time dilation. Does anyone see why we call it time dilation? Like everyone here knows what dilation means, right? Making things longer. Why are we calling this time dilation? Yeah, gamma is always greater than one. That's actually a good thing to note. Thank you, Gauger. Um, because, you know, gamma is this. This number, so V, uh, we are going to, uh, is this the right time to address it? So V is never going to be greater than C. You can see here that you run into some serious issues if V was ever greater than C, right? I think it's easier to say why that would be the case well, after we talked about relativistic energy and momentum. So we'll save that for next week. But uh, V is always going to be smaller than C, which means 1 minus some positive number square root. Of, so this will always be smaller than 1, which means gamma will be always bigger than 1. So that's a good uh, fact to know. Gamma is always greater than 1. And since you are multiplying the time kept by the clock itself in its own reference frame, multiply it by gamma, number greater than 1, this t is always going to be greater than the proper time. So we call, um, here's, because the, here's the thing. Uh, with the easy questions in special relativity, the biggest, uh, the most common mistake people make is um, forgetting which side something should be on. Like, is it tau equals gamma t? Or is it t equals gamma tau? <laughs> so <laughs> to avoid the confusion, this is a helpful phrase to know. Moving clocks are slow. That's uh, the English phrasing of time dilation. And this is the mathematical expression of moving clocks being slow. And this is what I mean by moving clocks are slow. So you see how fast this clock is going, you know, one second. And imagine comparing against your own watch. If this clock is moving past you at some speed comparable to the speed of light, <laughs> in the time this, it takes for this clock to count down one second, your own watch will count to something greater than one second. So this is slow. Yep. So, um, so that's time dilation. So not that complicated. Good. Uh, but it is uh, a bit um, unintuitive. And I guess uh, what we'll skip in the interest time, you can read about it in your textbook. So 5.3. Uh, your textbook does give you some examples of time dilation. And the most, of, I guess, uh, best known is a uh, measurement of the lifetime of muon. 
muon is an unstable particle discovered in the uh, 1920s, 30s, early 20th century. And um, um, the, the interesting thing about this is, and yeah, so it has a very short lifetime. And if you are assuming non-relativistic um, mechanics, then that's not enough time for it to ever reach Earth uh, from upper atmosphere where it's produced. But because of time dilation, uh, enough of them reach us to actually measure things. Um, yeah, so, so you, uh, you can read about that in the textbook. Um, so, so that's time dilation. Uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's, not, it's maybe not what you would have guessed, but once you drive it following these steps, it makes sense, right? Once you believe this, then you can believe that this bouncing back and forth of light somehow takes longer as this clock is moving uh, past you. Okay? 